Okay, so we're very happy to have uh, Jeff Young from the Mac Pro to join us here on the uh, Kyber Intelligence live interview for uh, why you want to do this uh, big data and machine learning investment firm Thank you. for the, the global market. So maybe we can start by sharing with us why do you wanted to fund Deep Macro. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm an economist. I've been an economist in the market for about 25 years. Um, and I've always thought that um, economists have uh, ignored a lot of the data that's out there. Um, governments release a huge amount of uh, statistics uh, but they're usually kind of old um, and everybody has access to them. I've always thought that uh, investing is all about getting an information edge um, and uh, now uh, there's a great opportunity uh, because there is so much more data available that as long as you have the techniques to get it uh, and the intelligence system to process it, uh, you can create actionable intelligence for investors. So it really gets back to the need for more information in order to make better investment decisions. And so before this uh, internet or this so-called internet of things uh, becoming a reality, uh, how did microeconomists and investors, and especially institutional investors, mm -hmm. make decisions with regards to their investments mm -hmm. and right. maybe trading strategy? And you know, how did they collect data and how do they interpret those right. data? And come well, I mean, a lot of it was uh, uh, looking at the Bloomberg. Um, you walk into the office every day and uh, you kind of look at the screen and make your own best guess as to what it all means. Um, of course, the investment banks uh, had very large uh, research staffs. Uh, so you'd uh, come in and you'd get emails from all the different banks and kind of sort it out. Uh, but it really, uh, those are not very systematic ways of looking at the world. Uh, and I think that they lead to a lot of different uh, biases. And they also, and very importantly, they lead to a lot of herd mentality. Um, you're all getting the same data and you're getting the same interpretation. Um, so it's very hard to actually create an edge um, if that's how you're getting your information. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples? Uh, I understand that sometimes you can uh, detect like certain hedge funds or certain investors or certain strategies tend to lose or win on the same day. Now, right. what are the reasons behind those? And if those reasons are well known, how or why would people still be making the same mistakes? Yeah. Right. Um, well, that's a, that's, a, that's a slightly different question than, than what we often do at Deep Macro. Mm -hmm. um, but um, again, it gets back to the herd mentality, mm -hmm. um, especially since the crisis. Um, crisis had a huge loss. And um, a lot of companies went under as a result of that. And it had two impacts. Um, first off, investors who put money into hedge funds, uh, they don't want, they have a very low tolerance for losing money. Um, normally they tell a fund, you know, we want you to make 10% a year and never lose more than two. Um, and so if the fund manager has only a small amount of money that they can lose, uh, they tend to play it safe. Uh, they tend to do the same trades that everybody else does so that in the case that they do lose money, at least they can say, look, everybody else did the same thing. Um, I think that that's actually a big driver of the herd mentality that we've seen you know, in the last couple of years. Okay, so, so how can Deep Macro help in this kind of an environment? Right, well, um, what we provide uh, is a couple of things. The first, off, the first thing is we're gathering data from different sources that most people don't have access to. Um, let me give you a couple examples. Uh, we look at the level of pollution in the atmosphere um, over quite small areas of the Earth, usually about 15 kilometers square. And it sounds kind of like a crazy data source, but in reality, it correlates quite well with industrial production because obviously the pollution that we see in the air is caused by human activity on the ground, at least a lot of it is. So that would be one example. We can also detect some of the uh, behavioral, the human behavioral uh, biases that you're referring to if we look at social media. Um, for example, if we want to know how are Chinese residents thinking about their own domestic real estate market, or how is that affecting what they think about the RMB. We can look at social media, uh, like Weibo. We can actually look at official media and try to distill what people are really thinking uh, about these assets and what they're likely to do. 
So um, this is another sort of example of a data source that you're not going to get from a government. Uh, they're not on any set, set release schedule. But when you think about their impact on the market, it's actually quite big. So we try to find data sources that are very high frequency and that are just different than what the market already has. The second part of what we do um, that I think is quite valuable is to, we have a framework for interpreting all of these variables and for converting them into information about the macro factors that affect asset prices. It all boils down to economic growth, inflation, and sentiment. And so um, unlike other companies that look, a lot of, look at a lot of data, we always try to say, what is the marginal impact of this information on growth? or on inflation or on sentiment. Because those are the building blocks for um, asset portfolios. And so that's, I think, a, a key advantage, uh, I guess, advantage that we provide. And then the third step is, as I just referred to, taking these ingredients on macro factors, so growth, inflation, sentiment, and putting them into actual asset portfolios that an asset manager might trade um, or might use as some sort of benchmark reference. Um, we have one in uh, foreign exchange, for example, that takes all of the information in the system and converts it into a set of positions. Uh, you know, you want to be long the euro or short the Swiss franc uh, or long the Swedish krona based on the deep macro information. So we really, what we offer is a bundle of data, factors, and portfolios. Um, new information, a classic way of interpreting the information, and then a way to express it. So it's really the, the, the package that is uh, useful for the investor. So we all know that there are so many data sources right. around the globe, and some of them are leading indicators, some of them are lagging indicators, mm -hmm. some of them are constantly being revised yes. by the official data, yes. and some of them are uh, facing structural biases mm -hmm. or due to maybe interpretation error or maybe mm -hmm. due to just human errors when they were collecting data. Mm -hmm. So how do you adjust for these uh, errors in right. arriving at certain conclusions right. from your models? Right. Um, one, one very important thing of what we do is we never overwrite any data. And we make sure that we uh, timestamp everything so that the data that we use um, to make a strategy is only the data that was available at the time that the market would have had to have made the decision. We call it a point in time. Um, and um, so we started this uh, when I was at my previous firm where I developed the factors, uh, which is over t about 10 years ago. So um, data are revised all the time, you're quite right. Um, what we now think of as uh, GDP in the US, uh, let's say for 2015, is not what the market thought when it was trading in 2015. But we can correct for that by just saving every data point uh, and time stamping it as of the time that it was released. So um, uh, it's a very laborious process. Uh, it took a long time to set up these, uh, these databases. And it's very hard to build it going backwards if you don't have it. Once the time has passed, it's very hard to go back and recreate uh, the data, especially globally, and we have a very broad global coverage. So that's probably the first way that we do it, is that we just preserve all the data as they are. Um, I'd say the second is, uh, you're probably going to say, well, what if the, those data themselves are bad? Um, obviously, it's a possibility, but we collect so much data, and we use some techniques uh, that we think are pretty robust to outliers. And in fact, we do a lot of filtering. We always filter for outliers. Uh, we make sure that the data can be seasonally adjusted. Uh, we make sure that there is a sufficiently long time history in order to really provide any meaning to the whole system. Um, so we really just very careful in making sure that any data source that we're thinking about meets the criteria that we have to include in the system. Let's go back to the, uh, the pollution yeah. or emission monitoring mm -hmm. mechanism sure. that you have. I suppose probably you have some kind of a satellite or some remote sensing equipment that allows you to look at the world in such a fine granularity. Yes. So if you look at those, say, emission data mm -hmm. or pollution data mm -hmm. and compare that to the, say, economic activity mm -hmm. of China, right. what, are the, what are the trends or what right. are the, the patterns that you typically observe? Right. And, and 
The, China is actually an area where it works pretty well. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. The first is that China is an industrial economy. So um, there's a lot of industry, it creates a lot of this stuff. You can then use that to tell you something about the overall economy because industry is a large share. Um, the other reason why is that the industry is relatively concentrated. Um, the, the Rust Belt heavy industry is mostly in the Northeast. There's a lot of other industry along the coastline, um, but at least it's in areas that we've kind of pretty well defined. And so um, we have found in our testing that relative to other countries, it works pretty well in China. Um, um, the, um, you still have a real challenge, though, of isolating which areas are the most important, um, uh, of isolating the seasonal factors. It tends to be highly seasonal, uh, the pollution. Um, but again, this is the sort of thing that just requires uh, a lot of uh, hard work, rolling up your sleeves and looking at it. Uh, we have a lot of machine uh, processing power, uh, but at least at our current state, uh, you still need people to kind of go through and guide the machine. Do you also employ like, underground troops to help you look at, uh, say, the real production activities or real economic activities on the ground in China and then make some human uh, adjustment or interpretation to the results compared to the machine readings? Well, we, um, we do include some of the official data, if that's what you mean, in, in, in the factors, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Um, but we, um, uh, we pretty much let it run on its own. Um, in other words, uh, it's a statistical process uh, that takes a lot of these data series. And really what it's trying to uh, find out is what is the common driver that really you can't see in any single series of all of them. Um, that's what the factor modeling is really designed to do. Um, and we think it does a pretty good job of picking things up. Um, and it does a pretty good job of helping an investor think about their invest uh, or in portfolios. Um, the, the foreign exchange portfolio that I referred to uh, has a very heavy growth component. Um, as far as I know, it's, that's fairly unique. Most foreign exchange strategies are about carry, so just interest rate high interest rate by the currency, um, and about momentum. If the currency is going up, buy it. Um, they're usually quite simple. Um, ours is very heavily weighted toward these fundamental factors, um, which a lot of people think are less amenable to uh, machine learning and machine techniques, but we think that that's where the opportunity is, because others aren't really doing it. Everybody else is doing carry. We prefer to be uh, doing um, you know, other, other factors. I recall that it was uh, Premier Li Keqiang uh, once said uh, to the media that he doesn't believe in the official release of data from China either. And he typically looks at the M2 growth mm -hmm. as the upper bound mm -hmm. and the electricity uh, consumption growth Correct. as the lower bound Correct. of the Chinese GDP growth. Yes. Now, how would you comment on that and can you detect the similar anomalies or upper and lower bounds? Uh, from your deep model. Right. I mean, uh, first off, I think that that's a widely shared view. Um, yeah. And in fact, uh, one interesting thing is we've had a lot of interest from Chinese entities, okay. um, including public sector ones, about our information on the Chinese economy. Uh, so that may or may not tell you something about uh, their confidence in what their own numbers are saying. Mm -hmm. um, um, sarcasm aside, um, more data are always helpful. Uh, and we're seeing that, uh, you know, it's not unique to China. We're seeing that from other uh, public sector entities as well. Uh, we, um, you know, talked to a lot of central banks and, and other um, public officials in other countries. Um, but returning to, uh, to China, um, you know, sometimes uh, I think GDP is a unique case. And GDP is just fundamentally not volatile enough uh, to account for what's going on in the Chinese economy. Um, that one has problems. I think that I agree uh, with the, uh, uh, the Premier that um, things like electricity uh, production or consumption, things like um, industrial production, um, they're pretty e a lot of industrial production is pretty easy to count. Um, you pretty much know how many cars are being produced. You know how much steel is being produced. So those are, those are more credible um, than, than, than others. Um, it's still very helpful, though, to look at our data because they come out much faster. Um, the satellite that you referred to, uh, we get data on a daily basis with a lag of about three days. If we're waiting for industrial production, um, it's a monthly number, and you have to wait uh, between a month and a month and a half in order to get it. So um, even if they're saying the same thing, it's always much better to get the newer 
and more uh, uh, high frequency data point. Now, I'd agree that a lot of the industrial activities or economic activities related to productions are directly or somewhat indirectly observable. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the financial activities, mm -hmm. especially financial flows, are mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. really observable. Right. And they are almost always at most detected right. from the reading of yes. the data. Yes. Or you may be able to infer from certain price actions exactly. in the market. Yeah. So how do you how, how do you do Very that? Very good question. I mean, um, I, indeed, that's normally what we do is look at the price and say, OK, there yeah. must have been some sort of flow. Um, there are some times, though, when I think flow uh, can be valuable to look at and that we can detect some uh, signs of it. Um, for example, let's think about the, the renminbi. Um, uh, China has had a relatively closed capital account, and uh, it's had some opening in the last couple of years. And there have been several instances where there have been pretty big capital outflows, um, and other instances where there have been pretty big capital inflows, even though the current uh, the capital account is supposed to be pretty closed. Um, well, uh, if you have a sense of where those flows are going, or when when they're when they're happening, you can do pretty well. And they don't really show up in the price uh, initially uh, because, again, um, the system is kind of controlled and the People's Bank of China is probably going to intervene in order to offset the impact on the value of the RMB. Um, so one of the things we look at uh, just is social media. Um, there's an active discussion on Weibo uh, about uh, the value of the RMB. And there is an active discussion about um, measures that you might, uh, things that you might do if you're thinking about taking money you know, out of the country. Um, you might start talking about, is it a good time to buy an apartment for my uh, son or daughter who's studying in Boston? Uh, you might start talking about buying insurance in Hong Kong. Uh, we know that there are many ways uh, to get around. Well, first off, we know that you can take out a certain amount of capital legally. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other ways that people do it to get above those um, limits. And so we can analyze that social media stream using machine uh, to judge how positive or how negative are the people who are posting these Weibos toward the RMB. And um, so far, it's actually been a pretty good indicator on a leading basis of those flows. Um, we see it correlated pretty well with the PBOC's intervention, for example. And that intervention is definitely offsetting the flows that we see. One constant theme in the marketplace regarding China, uh, we've been on China for a long time now, but then um, is to compare it to Japan. Mm -hmm. And to think about the so-called Jap Japan syndrome mm -hmm. uh, of the, uh, the post-bubble era. Right. right? So we know that Japan went through this whole asset inflation cycle mm -hmm. before the bubble bursting, mm -hmm. and then it went through the real estate cycle, right. and then this uh, so-called lost decade. Yes. Government intervention, quantitative easing, yes. and then it's still, the economy is still uh, somewhat trapped in a higher plateau. Now, if you look at Japan, and I understand you used to be uh, based in Japan for a long time, okay. so based on your experience and your current readings of the Chinese economy, and maybe uh, of the Japanese economy as well. Mm -hmm. How do you see China's economy going mm -hmm. uh, forward? So the overall economy, um, that's an interesting parallel. Mm -hmm. um, there are similarities and there are differences. Uh, I think the similarity is that um, you have uh, a financial system that uh, got overextended, um, partially because they were both uh, state-led, uh, if not state-owned. Um, and were used as tools of industrial policy. Um, so there's a lot of similarities. You, they both also had very large current account surpluses. Uh, they both also had uh, very high levels of domestic savings um, and, um, you know, and, and, and very, large, very rapid credit growth. Um, there are a lot of differences as well. Um, first has been the, you know, the population. Um, um, you know, China had a uh, very large and largely uh, rural population uh, when this whole process started. Um, and so it's been able to bring you know, just a lot of people into the modern economy uh, without any real upward impact on wages or anything like that. So it had a long runway to kind of get going. Um, Japan's demographics uh, you know, turned negative much, much, much uh, sooner than, than, than China's did. Uh, China's have definitely turned on the margin 
and it may develop a Japan problem fairly quickly, uh, but at least up until now, it's been, it's, it's been a lot better. Um, the, um, on, uh, if we think about the external side, though, uh, one of the critical differences is that um, when, the, uh, when Japan was making its current account surpluses in the 1980s, it was the private sector that was buying all the private assets. And then when the bubble burst, uh, they had to bring the money home because the banks had huge holes in their balance sheets and they, they brought the money home. And so the yen tended to get very strong, uh, rather paradoxically, when the Japanese economy weakened. Um, China's case is exactly the opposite. During the period, well, and China still has current account surpluses, but most of the assets are being accumulated by the public sector. The private sector has not been allowed to because of the capital controls. Now that's a little bit weaker, but we're seeing uh, um, the, if anything, the public sector is selling the, private, uh, the foreign assets, uh, the dollars that accumulated, to the private sector. And so uh, the currency tends to weaken as China's growth rate is shifting gradually to, toward a, a lower plane. Um, and that's actually kind of interesting. This yen strengthened, uh, the renminbi is weakening. I think the real thing that people worry about is, will China have a crisis uh, like uh, Japan had? And will the crisis lead to a lost decade, two decades, or whatever? Um, these are long-term issues. I think reasonable people can have uh, different uh, views on them. Um, I would say that you look at almost any country that's had rapid growth uh, in uh, credit, uh, uh, like uh, China's has, it's really hard to avoid some episode of financial turmoil. Um, whether we call it a crisis or not, uh, at what stage the government steps in or not, these are matters of debate. Uh, it's quite clear that the Chinese government has more resources than many other countries uh, who hit the wall, so to speak, uh, did. So I don't think it would sink the economy. But um, you know, human nature is that even governments, even strong governments, usually take a little bit of time to figure out what's going on. Even governments that are not democracies have political reasons why you can't use public money right away. Um, think about the United States in 2008. Um, the first time that the TARP program was put before Congress, uh, it was voted down and the market collapsed. And then they had to go back and redo it. Um, the US had the resources. Uh, we're the global reserve currency, so people actually bought dollars um, into this horrible crisis that the US uh, caused for the rest of the world. Um, nonetheless, look what happened in the markets. We had a real crisis. I would imagine that China will have something similar at some point. Uh, it will be very sharp. Uh, it will be solved. But uh, the fact that they have the resources doesn't mean that they will deploy them on day one. It's very difficult for anybody, no matter how good you are, to realize what's going on in real time. Many differences aside, you know, one common uh, feature that China and Japan share is that they Oh, are a very big buyer of U.S. treasuries. Yes. And knowing that they, the central banks of the world, especially BOJ and PBOC, and maybe include Fed as well, are sporting a very big balance sheet. Yeah. And given the fact that, uh, well, we, we saw from uh, Jenna Yadin's comment last night that the, uh, the skating back of the, uh, this quantitative easing operation is going to continue. And you, you could argue that uh, the Chinese economy is pretty inflated and leveraged if you count the shadow banking activities mm -hmm. as well. And perhaps BBOZ is also contemplating how to manage that balance sheet risk. Now, how do you, how do you, how do you see that? And especially given your model readings, mm -hmm. how would you recommend right. uh, people adjust or maybe manage this kind of a right. major risk? Right. Well, I, let, let's start with the Fed, and then we can go to uh, maybe, uh, maybe China. Um, I think one of the things that came out from the Fed, especially in the minutes that came out, uh, is that they're going to be very cautious. Uh, they're going to be as transparent as they can. And they almost, I think they're basically saying we would like a preset sort of schedule in term, so that the market will know what's coming. Um, almost like we pretty much knew how much it was going to be buying on the upside. It's almost like the mirror image of that. We kind of want to see. They want to tell us how it's going to roll off. Um, I think it's pretty clear they just want to have this to be as um, painless uh, a, a process for the market as possible. 
That's not to say that it will be perfect, uh, but I don't think that the Federer policy, you know, they're, they're policymakers, they don't shoot for perfection. They, they probably are shooting for good enough right now. And uh, as long as growth is pretty reasonable, and as long as inflation is at or maybe slightly above their, their, their target, uh, they feel that they can continue this transparent and gradual, or they will be able to embark on uh, a transparent and gradual shrinkage of the balance sheet. Um, given what's happened since they have started to raise rates, I think that as a base case, that's probably reasonable. Um, at this stage, I don't think anybody in the market doesn't know that the Fed is thinking about and probably going to be doing this, um, absent a big shock uh, that would, you know, that would put that on ice. Um, now, if uh, if they did that when growth was weak and inflation is very low, that would be a different story. But everything we've seen from the Fed in the last couple of years is that they kind of learned their lesson from withdrawing the stimulus too early at various points in the past. So they're going to be fairly cautious. Um, I think that obviously the, 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 the PBOC, the, the Bank of Japan, uh, you know, all the other central banks are eyeing this very carefully. Um, and um, they're, uh, they're, they're aware of that. I think um, yeah, China's case is a little bit unique because of their exchange rate policy. Um, for China's a very large economy, um, and it's the biggest uh, trading economy in the world. Um, but their monetary policy is, I think, more appropriate for a smaller economy because it, it emphasizes the exchange rate. Um, it's not a fixed rate system. It's not pegged. And I really I kind of get upset when people say it's pegged. It's not pegged. Uh, but it is heavily managed. Um, and it's uh, still heavily managed with respect to the dollar, even though we have this basket. Um, and so what that means is that, to some degree, it's inevitable that um, China is going to be importing the Fed's monetary policy. And I think that that's behind some of these liquidity squeezes that we've seen in the last couple of years that tend to happen when the Fed is raising rates or signaling that it's going to be raising rates. So let's fast forward to the end of the year when we think that the Fed is going to be embarking on this. Now, um, that will impart some tightness uh, you know, into the PBOC's policy. From, if I look at the, the PBOC over the long run, it does look like they are moving away from that. Uh, and so um, they're trying to dissociate themselves from the Fed. Um, I think that's mostly what happened in August 2015. Uh, when uh, really what they're trying to do is just loosen up the uh, exchange rate from the dollar a little bit. And um, over time, it's actually been successful. The transition was super rocky, as we all remember. Um, but look at what's happened since then. Um, the dollar's gone up, but the renminbi in trade-weighted terms has gone down. And so uh, that's, I, I, I don't want to say that they've cut the link, but they certainly weakened it a lot. So um, maybe I'm just being a little bit optimistic that this can be managed. Uh, but I think it's long past time when China uh, should have a more domestically focused uh, monetary policy. And it seems like that's what they, are, they have been implementing with a certain amount of success. And the Fed is trying to make it easier on everybody just by being so transparent. I'd like to go back to the social media and the sentiment model that mm -hmm. they, the, the, uh, the macro has built. Uh, I understand you have been using that uh, machine learning toolkits to detect people's sentiment on FX. Yes. What about real estate uh, in China? Right. And, and, then, uh, and as well as we know that in social media, fake news and, and data discrepancy or unreliability, a lot of those issues, propaganda and whatnot. Now, how do you adjust for right. that? Sure. Um, we do the same thing in real estate that we do with um, the RMB. So, um, and that's almost easier because uh, real estate is it's an up or down sort of thing. So, um, we construct an index uh, that measures uh, how optimistic or how pessimistic uh, people are on Weibo about Chinese real estate. Um, and it tends to obviously correlate with real estate prices, um, which in turn tends to correlate with their views toward the RMB. If they get really pessimistic on real estate, they tend to be pessimistic on the RMB. And that's when you see the capital outflows um, and vice versa. So um, that's another part of uh, the social media analysis that we do. 
Um, in terms of uh, filtering and the fake news, it's, it's quite clear that it exists. And we saw that very clearly in um, a lot of the electoral work that we've done. Uh, for example, we covered the French presidential election very, very carefully. Um, and um, some of the, um, I wouldn't call it fake news, but the, there's obviously bots. There are obviously, um, some of the campaigns were much more active in using those uh, than others. Um, and a lot of the activity on Twitter was clearly caused by entities that were not um, in, in, in France. Um, so what do we do with that? Uh, first off, some of it was easy to detect. Uh, you could just look at how many times they tweeted. Um, no human is going to tweet 500 times a day, at least nobody that I know. Um, but some of these accounts were doing it, so it was pretty clear you know, that, that would be in the, the bot category. Um, some of them clearly originated from outside of France, and those were probably uh, bots as well. Um, so we, we set those aside. Uh, but it's also important to see how do people react to that? How do real non-bots, in other words, uh, is that a new word, a non-bot for a person? <laughs> um, 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 uh, how do real people respond? Because if it's generated by a bot, but people like it and start retweeting it and favoriting it, well, that's also telling us something. It's not about the tweeter, but it's talking about the tweetee and how they use that to try to tell their friends or their colleagues or just people in social media. Uh, what they think and who they're preferring. So um, it's, uh, I think it's fascinating. Um, it, uh, some of it should be filtered out, but we, instead of throwing it away, we normally just put it in a different category to sort of look at what sort of me different meaning we can get from it. Yeah. We know that there are bots tweeting news and there are bots reading bots tweets yes. of the news and there are bots trading on those readings of the bots yes. of the real world. Right. Right? And, and this kind of an algorithmic arms race among yes. hedge funds and uh, institutional investors. Yeah. And how do you make of it uh, in this kind of a new era right. uh, or new normal, so yeah. to speak? Well, you know? I guess, I mean, I'm a data person. And so um, you know, to the extent that you can find a signal out of data, um, and trade on it, I, I think that this is uh, probably good in a lot of dimensions. Uh, the one dimension where I think it's a little bit risky, though, is that um, these are all very high frequency, and they're usually purely related to flows um, and very short-term sentiment measures, like you mentioned. Uh, there's not a lot of room for valuation in those type of trading strategies. So um, if something is going up, it generally says to buy it. If something's going down, it generally says to sell it. Um, and that's the one thing that I, I do worry about, uh, that um, without any valuation anchor, without anybody to take the other side because they think an asset price is overvalued and going short, uh, it can, the asset can depart further and further um, from the fair value. If we go back to the, and this is one of the things that we built Deep Macro on, is that valuation still matters. Uh, the portfolios uh, that we're building, the one in FX that we already have and we show to our customers, um, it has a very heavy valuation component. Um, it, just like growth, where I, I, I mentioned that uh, the growth factor has a high weight relative to other FX strategies, um, valuation also has a very high weight. Uh, that is the long-term anchor that we think currencies will move to. And so you know, we think that you should combine the two. The data are very helpful to get signals. Um, but we also need to have a valuation anchor because uh, we want to, in the portfolio, uh, we always want to hedge against the risk that something is just going up because it's been going up. Without those rel relative value and investors stepping in to take or provide liquidity, mm -hmm. Uh, certainly, the, the market's one-sided risk mm -hmm. is uh, probably going to be magnified uh, during the, uh, some kind of liquidity event. Now, why would that be the case? Is it because of regulation or because of some change in the macro environment that precipitates uh, this uh, change of preference? Why people risk are appetite? on the same side? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a hard question to really answer. Uh, having had um, experience at a um, um, and an RV fund uh, and did a macro fund. Um, I would say that uh, my experience is that macro funds tend to be momentum driven. Um, and if, you look at, if you look at macro fund returns in the aggregate and uh, compare those to uh, momentum st strategies, um, they're pretty correlated. 
So a lot of times, macro funds are like momentum just in macro clothing, okay? Um, and so given that the RV, you know, people who trade more on mean reversion, uh, their weight in the market is just is much lower. Um, the, naturally, the people who are left tend to be, you know, kind of getting crowded, uh, you know, in the first place. So I think that's part of it. I think there's also just a very limited um, risk, uh, low uh, tolerance for losses. It's, and it per, it's pervasive. The people who put money in hedge funds, you know, have much lower loss tolerance than they used to. Uh, that's a function of the institutionalization of the hedge fund industry. Um, the stereotypical investor in a hedge fund in the early days was some rich person who wanted to make a lot of money and would accept the risk of a loss you know, in order to do that. But now that it's institutional money that's going in, um, and a lot of times it's public sector, and so they have mandates that you can't lose X, Y, Z, uh, it makes the hedge funds much more cautious as well. And um, I think that means that you know, they tend to, there's safety in numbers, right? So they tend to kind of stay in the same trades. Um, the other factor that relates to the fundamentals is that if, um, int suppose interest rates in the major countries are all at or very close to zero, which they have been for a long time. Well, how do you, what is the fundamental basis for having different trades if the level of dispersion of interest rates is very, very low? Well, I would, I'd have a hard time as well. Um, and um, so you tend to get uh, people in the same short-term trades just because there just aren't that many opportunities. Once again, to bring it back to the foreign exchange portfolio we have, um, the, most, the, 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 the pillar of our strategy that's most related to that is our carry one. And right now it's off because we just don't see big enough differentials to justify taking those uh, positions. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't participate in that. Hopefully we'd be a little bit on the other side of the boat um, from the others. Certainly very interesting time. And then if we were to venture out, maybe three years, mm -hmm. how would you imagine the macro will be uh, by then? Successful. Uh, successful. <laughs> Rich, <laughs> Hopefully. Handsome. But how, how are yeah. we going to do that? You know, uh, what is your business model down the road? And how are you going to develop this deep macro into a, uh, right. maybe a bigger institution than it is today? Right. You know? um, there, well, there's a couple of things. I mean, the first is to uh, increase the penetration of our core research product. Uh, we really only started marketing it at the end of last year or early this year. Um, and I think the, enth the reception has been very enthusiastic. Um, you know, we have clients in the UK and in, in the US. Uh, we will be having some in Japan. Um, fingers crossed, uh, you know, here in Taiwan, even though this is our first day um, in the mainland, uh, Singapore. So we feel that we really have struck a chord. Uh, again, it's the combination of the new data and the, but applied to the traditional investment problems that any money manager has. So we uh, really just want to increase our data sources. Um, we're negotiating for access to data on a variety of things, um, especially related to payment systems. I'm really intrigued by the amount of information that we can get from uh, payments systems. So that's one of the areas of, of focus for us. Um, the second, though, would be um, really emphasizing the portfolios um, that I've, pr I've referred to. Uh, we are developing these portfolios in different asset classes, um, in equities, um, in fixed income, in a cross-asset, let's say, tactical asset allocation um, uh, framework as well, um, so that uh, we can eventually market those directly. Uh, that's where I think there's a lot of growth prospect uh, but it really does get back to the intellectual capital that we built into the system. Um, we're just firm believers in the idea that um, in order to invest well, you have to know the global macro world. Uh, the global economy affects more asset prices than any other single factor. And so knowing more about that is what gives you the edge, and that's what we're trying to build into those portfolios. Final question. Where would you put your money right now? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, um, aside from investing more in uh, deep, deep macro, macro, which I've already done. <laughs> One of the things that uh, our system is very positive on the pound sterling. Um, why, uh, when there's this huge Brexit risk? Uh, well, the first thing is that the currency already moved way down. And so it, score, it ranks as very cheap um, on our valuation model. 
Um, the second thing is, is that because the currency uh, depreciated a lot, it will be providing some stimulus um, to the economy. And so we feel that there's going to be a, a decent up, upturn of the business cycle. Um, the third one, and this is less related to the macro, it's more of a judgment call of my own. Um, I'm not convinced that being in the EU has given a lot of countries economic benefits net-net. Um, the UK has a highly professional and competent bureaucracy. I think that they can negotiate their way through this stuff. And uh, at that point, if you're talking about two to three years from now, I think sterling is going to be a lot higher. So long sterling, short euro. Short euro. That would be one of them. Um, there's any number of, uh, of other currencies that you could probably uh, took, take, take a look at as well. So let's mark that date. It's on May 24, 2017. Let's uh, look forward to two years from the now, where's sterling? unfolding of this, uh, this risk scenario. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jeff, for sharing with us this uh, comprehensive insights about deep macro and the world economy. Thank you. Hyper intelligence. Thank you very much.